Welcome to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to give you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to take a quick moment to let you guys know about an awesome product I've been using. You see, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that it's really important to take good care of your skin, but that it's also really important to choose products that are all natural and free from harmful chemicals. That's why I was so excited when I discovered Caldera Labs The Good. Here's the gist. The Good is a one-step skincare serum for every type of skin, clinically proven to make your skin look tighter, healthier, and smoother. I've been putting it on every morning, and my wife is absolutely thrilled that I'm finally taking care of my skin, plus she loves how I smell too. To try out Caldera Labs The Good and get 20% off your first order, visit calderalab.com slash superhuman or use the discount code superhuman. That's Caldera Lab, C-A-L-D-E-R-A. L-A-B dot com slash superhuman. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome to this week's episode, lovingly crafted thanks to a review from Ido in Ireland, who says, so interesting and fun to learn from. Five stars, the podcasts are so varied and interesting, they keep me glued and coming back for more, intelligent conversation, but fun and light. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Aiden, for your wonderful review. We really do appreciate it. And for those of you who have not left a review, well, please do, because I will read it on the air. On to today's episode. Today, we are joined by Pete Makaitis. He is an award-winning speaker and coach, host of the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast, and an expert who teaches professionals how to perform optimally at work. You've seen him in the New York Times, Forbes, Inc., and you've probably heard about his coaching where he coaches world-class leaders in world-class organizations like Google, FedEx, Amazon, Apple, Anheuser-Busch, and even the United Nations. Absolutely incredible. In this episode, we talk about Pete's own journey from being a salaried employee and a consultant all the way to his decision to go out and become an entrepreneur, why he did it, how he did it, and his advice for being your absolute best, being superhuman, if you will, in the workplace. How do you actually make a difference? How do you actually stand out? And of course, I asked him about all his favorite ways to perform at his absolute best. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I know you will as well. So please meet my new super friend, Pete Mikaitis. Mr. Pete Mikaitis, how are you, my friend? Oh, Jonathan, I'm awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm really, really happy to have you here. I'm excited to talk about your field of expertise. I find that high-performance people always have high-performance habits, and uh, I'm excited to discover and unveil some of yours. Oh, I'm excited as well to be discovered. I love it. So, Pete, tell me a little bit about your origin story. Sure thing. Well, you know, I, I love the way, and that is just the perfect way to phrase that question, by the way. Uh, yeah, I, I get such a kick out of that. Why, thank you. I, I just changed the way that we ask it. I was like, God, I've been missing this opportunity for like five years. I could be asking it. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, superhuman, superheroes. I, you know, it's funny, Superman was my role model who I wanted to be. I'd watch the Christopher Reeve movies on loop as a child and on VHS back in the day. But I think I discovered that it is indeed possible to become all the more superhuman when you do some great learning. So my origin story really starts in my hometown of Danville, Illinois, at the Danville Public Library, where I learned that as a youngster, if I was feeling stir crazy, wanted to get out of the house, my dad would readily take me to the library whenever I asked. So like, okay, that's a good little trick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I asked frequently and then we got into an interesting little groove where I would take an interest in a certain subject. Maybe it was like chess or photography and I'd read a bunch of these books on the topic and then lo and behold, I got better at those things. I read the chess books that I got better at chess that I, I beat my dad without him letting me win. And I was like, whoa, 
that's cool. I read the photography books. I was taking, you know, better, more beautiful photos. I was like, that's cool. And so there, I think were really the seeds of the origin story was that, you know, books or, or learning or knowledge make you better at stuff. And so if you go get that knowledge, you go get better. It's awesome. Man, that so echoes my story. And I remember the first time I discovered that a book could make me a better version of myself, it like blew my mind. Because up until that age, books had only been about what I learned in school and passing the test. Exactly, right. And then there could be any number of things. And so you just pursue them. And, and then when I discovered, boy, books about success, goal setting, leadership, uh, teamwork, all that stuff. My favorite Dewey Decimal number at the library was 158.1. Success, psychological aspects. And I just devoured those. And, and even sort of when I became a teenager, I strapped a, a boombox into my old school 1989 Chevrolet Celebrity vehicle because it didn't have a tape player. And uh, that's what I was driving, even though it was like 2000. <laughs> it's an 11 year old car, fine for a high schooler. And I would be playing all these, these tapes by like uh, Stephen Covey or Tony Robbins or John C. Maxwell and it just sort of uh, absorbing it as I'm cruising. Wow, really, really cool. You must have been so popular listening to those tapes, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, most people had no interest in, in listening, but I was actually pretty popular. I was the homecoming king, fun fact, since we're going no back kidding. in time. All right. Well, I shouldn't have doubted you there. But I think that the reason was I went to a, a tiny school before I went to the public high school and I'm an extrovert and I had so much like pent up, I want to meet people in this, <laughs> that I was just always talking to people and curious about people and, and interested in, in their different things they were doing. So I formed a broad coalition from across, you know, marching band and drama to anything and everything. Uh, and so I uh, was victorious. Really cool. So tell me about after high school, where did this interest and passion for self-improvement take you? Oh, sure thing. Well, then I, I went on to college and I studied organizational administration at the University of Illinois. And I got rather interested in strategy consulting and the work that these folks are doing at companies like a McKinsey, Bain & Company, Boston Consulting Group, and thought that sounds like a real cool thing. That's what I would like to do. And so I set my sights on that and practiced a lot for their unique interview process. And ultimately, I got an internship at Bain and took it and sort of began full-time work there. And that sort of set a, a lot of things up with regard to having a mindset associated with, you know, being data-driven and strategic and, um, and really just optimizing the crap out of uh, a given opportunity. So where did you take it after that? Obviously, today you are no longer at Bain. Tell me about that pivot moment. You know, that's true. Well, I mean... In a way, it wasn't super dramatic, like I, I sort of left and, and turned my back because it was sort of the norm in the industry after three-ish years, like, hey, what are you going to go do? You want to go to business school? You want to go to private equity or, or corporate strategy? Sort of what are you thinking? And, and so what I was thinking was, you know what? I've been having so much fun doing sort of speaking on the side and working with folks and, and sharing knowledge and seeing people transformed that I'd really like to be doing that as my primary thing full time. Really cool. And so that's what I did. I, I didn't really have a great plan, which is ironic. I, I should know a lot about, you know, business plans and, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was like, you know what? I've seen some speakers who don't really impress me and they're getting paid and I really like doing this. So I'm pretty sure I can find a way. And that was kind of the, the decision point. And I kind of went after it and I sort of stumbled in some ways as I, as I relearned the fundamental lessons that, hey, you know, just because you're passionate about something or, or you really like to do something doesn't mean you're going to get paid for that something. And you really got to answer those basic questions associated with, OK, you know, who is the customer? What is their pain or problem or need? How can I solve that, you know, uniquely or helpfully or differentiatedly uh, relative to their other options that they have available such that it is kind of worthwhile from a, a, a money perspective there? So yeah, it took a little while uh, for me to zero in on those things, but it's worked out. And so now I think with uh, the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast has really been uh, growing nicely, about 8 million downloads we just hit. And the associated sort of trainings that I'm doing with regard to helping individuals and teams 
just think and collaborate all the more effectively is massively valuable, you know, based upon, you know, just all the hours that can be wasted during the course of a, of a work day, work year, and, and the dollars that adds up to. If you could take a bite out of that, that is very handy and worth some money for clients. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I have been meaning to thank you and I figured I would get to thank you on the air. You guys did the coolest thing of any podcast I've ever been on. And you not only sent me a t-shirt, you sent me a handwritten note, which referenced, I mean, it wasn't mass produced because it referenced what we talk about. And I was just so impressed. And I know my buddy, Joe Polish, who is big on send something in the physical mail would just love that. So kudos to you guys. That was the coolest thing to get that in the mail. Oh, thank you. Yes. Well, I'm glad you dug it. And that's really the scoop. I mean, I am genuinely appreciative of guests sharing their their wisdom and expertise. And um, so it, it just feels natural to do so. And it's just really kind of fun to imagine, you know, all the superhumans out there, you know, totally. sporting this T-shirt as I am, too. It's kind of like a, a community or a power vibe going. Totally. And uh, I need to pick your brain about how you execute that strategy because we totally want to copy it. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. (laughs) So where's your area of genius? I mean, obviously, how to be awesome at your job. You've done an incredible job with that podcast. You also work with clients. What are kind of some of the areas, because you and I both have this fascination with how can we use knowledge to be better people. You have a very different background from mine, which is consulting and working in large corporations and things like that. What would you say is your superpower? Right. You know, I think my superpower is just uh, doggedly digging down until we hit the thing, you know, because and and I think with consulting and and they do that, too, because consultants are sometimes, I don't know, lambasted, lampooned, made fun of because, oh, yeah, the consultants, they'll just steal your watch to tell you what time it is. (laughs) (laughs) And by that, I think they mean hey, you know, the employees of the uh, client organization have mentioned the solutions that you are providing. So what the heck are you offering? Well, what I think what the consultant offers and, and what I offer, you know, when I'm just kind of thinking in my own life and or with clients is that, well, there are hundreds or thousands of potential options, plans, things to pursue. And if your sort of to-do list or your quote priority list has many, 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 many things, well, then you're going to get cluttered. You're going to get unfocused. You're, you're not going to have the clarity and you're going to be pursuing items that have a sub optimal level of, of impact and, and leverage for you. And so I love talking about the 80-20 principle from uh, the economist Alfredo Pareto, which suggests that you know 80% of results come from 20% of causes, and thus the remaining sort of leftover 20% of results come from 80% of causes. So a lot of people take away from that that, oh, yeah, you know what, you should prioritize because you know some things are, are a bit more important than others. And I'd say no, 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 no. Some things are not a bit more important than others. Some things are 16 times as effective as others. And I've seen that again and again in my business in terms of, you know, my investments and what I'm doing. Some activities and pursuits generate literally over 16 times as much profit per hour as others, even though on the surface they might seem, you know, like two reasonably maybe equal-ish options to pursue. Mm Mm-hmm. So how does one go through doing that? I mean, how, because I spend so much time talking about this and even teaching it in my courses, you know, the whole Eisenhower decision matrix and choosing the rocks. And yet even I get sucked into, I think we all do, we get sucked into things that are top of mind, but not top of priority. Certainly. Well, and, and what's also interesting in terms of, you know, top of mind, top of priority, you might say top of your fun list or what's sort of more kind of desirable or interesting because often, you know, we procrastinate those very things that uh, could be quite valuable, but, you know, are not as fun and interesting to pursue. It's like, you know, figure out a way to get someone to handle the invoicing, you know, oh, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun, but by golly, if you did, you know, that might save you, you know, an hour, two, three more a month. And thusly, that's, it's so leveraged and valuable to pursue that. So, uh, so that could be one indicator right there. I had Perry Marshall on the show and, and he said, when my procrastination demons go off, that's often an indicator I really do need to, uh, you know, pursue that very thing, you know, that, um, that I'm right. putting off. 
So that, that's one little indicator. But more so, I recommend kind of getting into a bit of the numbers, you know, in terms of, you know, if it is like a financial pursuit, I have a simple spreadsheet that gets into it in terms of, okay, what are all the activities necessary to accomplish this thing? How many hours do all of those things take? And then what is sort of the lift or benefit in terms of revenue increase or cost decrease that I might expect to get? And so then we, we sort of get that uh, calculated over how many years or what period of time What's my probability of success. And so it's just very simple a spreadsheet I could fill out in about five minutes. And then when I do so, I can see, okay, what is the expected profit generated per hour invested of all these different initiatives? And I can say, wow, holy smokes, this one is, you know, five times as valuable as the other one. Let me really focus all my efforts on this one. And just having that knowledge is so helpful because you'll see another opportunity pop up like, oh, hey, here's that thing. They can say, no, no, no. I am aware that this other pursuit will be five times as valuable and thusly, I'm going to go after it. And so, and your goal might not even be money. You might be thinking about how can I deliver the most delight to, I'm thinking about my wife with regard to like the honey-do lists, you know, like there's all these things you could do, yep. but you could sort of check in and say, hey, you know, what would just make you smile the most and be such a relief if it were handled, you know, on like a zero to 10 scale, zero is like, don't even care. Five is like, oh, it's kind of nice. Ten's like, ah, wonderful. And then I could sort of compare that score against how long the things take and be surprised like, oh, wow. So if I just uh, sanitize this nasty little, you know, section of the under the sink, (laughs) that would make your day or your month. Oh, that's going to take me 20 minutes. All right. Well, that's what I'll do first. So I think it's great to just really ask the questions It's almost obsessive. I had a guest, Morton Hansen. He said one of the the high performance habits of uh, professionals is to do less than obsess. And I think it's a good turn of phrase is that you really kind of ask so many questions that many people would just have given up by then. My mom is kind of exasperated, for example, when she has a cool, she finds like a cool product or something. I'll ask her like nine follow-up questions like, oh, how did you discover it? How does it compare to the others? Do you find this feature to be superior in this way? And to what extent? And she's like, I don't know, Pete. I just like it. <laughs> but when you bring that kind of intense curiosity um, to something, you really start to see you know, cool opportunities that get overlooked because you see, oh my gosh, if, if this little thing is true, well, then there are huge implications from how that uh, gets applied in life. That's really cool. So what I'm hearing, if I'm understanding, is is really thinking about not just the impact of something, which I think many people don't even get that far, right? What is going to be the impact of doing this versus another thing? But also what I liked about what you said is what is going to be the impact relative to the investment, right? Because if I switch it to financial terms in dollars and cents, it's like you would never assess an investment by I'm going to make $10 off this. Well, making $10 out of 10 is is really bad, but making $10 off of one, you know, it's this relative, how much do I need to invest in time or in money? And how much do I make based on that? And you can't evaluate things along that same criteria. I really love that idea. Oh, cool. Thank you. And I think you could apply it to any number of things you got to prioritize. Like I remember I had a project once doing some nonprofit consulting for this organization that was doing sort of environmental work. And they had a real cool piece of intellectual property or or approach they were using for investing in wildlife conservation. And they call them biodiversity hotspots in terms of where are the particular places on this earth that have tons of different species of plants and animal life Okay. And then what kind of money is it going to take to protect them and keep them alive and operating? And then they could say, looking across the whole globe, we can zero in on, hey, you know what? There are just a few hundred square miles <laughs> you know, that we're, that make all the difference. And that's what we're going after. So I think about it in terms of an effectiveness ratio of the outcome you're after on the numerator. It could be profit, could be wildlife conservation. Then the constraint as the denominator on the bottom could be hours or, you know, could be dollars. So I'm often looking at profit per hour as an example in terms of the honeydew list that could be a delight, you know, per hour. And that really, I think, illuminates things quite a lot. And when you've got 50 options, you just sort of sit down and 
and put a number to them. You're like, well, holy smokes, you know, these four are really, really, really worth doing. And the rest, you know, maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can fit them in. Love that. All right, let's take a quick pause here to thank this episode's sponsor, Comrade Socks. For years, I've been a fan of compression socks, especially for long days of travel. The problem? Most compression socks are ugly, expensive, and uncomfortable, but not Comrade Socks. Their stylish compression socks are something you'll be proud to wear. Plus, they use medically proven and lab-tested true graduated compression and smart silver antimicrobial technology to keep your legs feeling and smelling great. To get 20% off on your very own pair, visit comradesocks.com slash superhuman or use the coupon code superhuman. That's C-O-M-R-A-D-S-O-C-K-S dot com slash superhuman. All right, let's get back to the episode. I want to change gears a little bit, Pete, and I, I want to talk about this whole idea of being awesome at your job, not just because you've interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of experts on how to be awesome at their jobs, but also you've coached people at some of the world's largest and most successful companies. I've never had a job, so to speak, (laughs) that I didn't sign the paycheck for. So I'm curious, like in today's market where obedience is not the primary criteria like it was during the industrial revolution, I mean, what things have stood out to you in your work, in interviewing, What makes people really phenomenal at their job? Superhuman, if you will, at their job. Oh, I will. Thank you. Well, you know, there's really a few. And one of them, I think we just talked about that, that clarity, that focus, that prioritization, you know, is because if you are primed to see what's really going to generate the most value and make the biggest impact, then that, you know, really goes a long way. So so that's kind of one of them. But I think the other one, and maybe more fundamentally, is just that, just that you care, you know, like... It's so funny. This has come up so many times on my podcast. It's almost like trite. <laughs> when they cite the Gallup in- engagement numbers, I almost have begun editing that out of the of the interviews just because my, my listeners have probably heard it 50 times because they're bad and they can serve as a, a proof point to everything. And those numbers are something like two-thirds-ish of uh, employees, and it depends on what, what nation you're looking at, are not engaged in their jobs. So that's the story and and it's relative uh, minority or fewer people really are. And so, you know, that is correlated to all kinds of things like, you know, higher turnover, you know, less creativity and all this stuff. So I think in a way, that's one of the fundamental points is that you just, you actually care in terms of what your organization's mission, vision, values are, or what your team is trying to do or, or who you serve you know, those, the user or, or the customer, the stakeholders, like you really do want to do what y'all are purporting to do well, I'd say with excellence and you think it, it matters and you want to have that done at a great quality and quantity because it does something for you. Now, I, I think that's huge. And if you don't have that, I mean, you're not really inspired to get good ideas. You don't really care to, to stick around. You don't want to kind of help out um, a, a colleague when it doesn't really directly impact you know, you and your, your metrics and such. So I think that it's almost kind of too obvious or simple or fundamental, but it's so often missing and it makes a huge difference is that you give a hoot about what you're doing. Yeah. And it, it's not a given is the sad thing is that a lot of people, and I see this in Israel because there is this culture, not as bad maybe as in South Korea, right? But there's this culture of like, work involves some suffering. And in order to demonstrate that you are doing a good job, you better be suffering at least a little bit because that's just how work has to be. And, you know, we all have that friend who has every single time you've seen them for the last two years told you how much they hate their job and yet they never freaking quit. So I wish it were a given, like you should love what you do, but unfortunately it's not. Right. And that suffering point, boy, I, I think that that's a really juicy one to just, if you sit and think about it for a while. I had a guest, her name is Rahaf Harfouche, and she was fantastic in, in talking about 
these notions of, of why we feel guilty if we're not working hard enough, and like what's behind that. It's sort of like culturally and technologically and economically. And, and so, and she had a really cool turn of a phrase, which was performative suffering that a lot of employees are doing just that. It's, it's like they have to perform to impress and to show off you know, the extent to which, you know, they are, are suffering and that means they are committed, et cetera. And it's really just not helpful. And it's true. I, I think in, even in your, you said you've, you've never had a job per se in, in which you weren't signing the paychecks, but I mean, we engage, you and I, entrepreneurs, we engage in activities that generate wealth <laughs> as you might call that working or a job. And I would think that you could back me up on this. It is, it isn't a dream come true every minute of the day, but there are hassles and frustrations and pieces of activity that uh, we prefer not to do that yet need to get done. And hopefully over time, you know, you can, you know, outsource, automate, minimize, but there's still some stuff, you know, that, that yeah. lingers. So yeah, there's some suffering and we're going to do it, but hopefully that is a modest proportion of the workday. And there are, are more things that get you juiced. And there's some stuff you can do with your own mindset and attitude with regard to that. And there's some stuff that's just universally crappy. And uh, you, you might want to look around at other options. Right. Absolutely. Now, tell me a bit about some of your high performance habits. I mean, I know you coach on a wide range of things with your clients, but I also kind of one of my discoveries throughout the years has been doesn't matter if I'm interviewing a guest who's an entrepreneurship expert or someone who's a marathon runner, high performance people, as, as I said, have these high performance habits. I wonder if you could walk us through the things that you do on a given day to perform your best. Oh, sure thing. Yes. Well, I'll start with even before the day starts, I'm pretty hardcore about sleeping enough. And um, my wife is a saint. I love her so much. We have two children under two years old. And she has done almost all of the sleep sacrificing on that dimension. And for that, I salute her. And we, we always have these conversations like, um, hey, if it's a big day for you, I can make the sacrifice. I could do the suffering. And she's like, you know what? You need the sleep more. And what you're able to produce in a day varies greatly based on how much you have it. So sleep is huge. And I'm big on it. And, and you've probably heard all the sleep hygiene things, but I often do choose to wear earplugs and a sleep mask and have a cool, you know, quiet, dark environment, all that stuff. So great sleep is where it starts. And then in the morning, I've kind of got this groove going so that, you know, I will wake up, I will weigh myself, just make sure we're, you know, staying in line. I will pour uh, 20 ounces of cold water and have a couple almonds and my multivitamin, my D vitamin and my probiotic. I will then proceed to walk on the treadmill at a four mile per hour pace for approximately 40 minutes with some blue light exposure while doing some, some prayer and gratitude, you know, reflection and maybe uh, listen to something uplifting, you know, as well, such as uh, maybe some daily scripture readings or a podcast that's positive. And then I'm in the groove. It's like, all right, we'll start this day. I will write on a giant, thick, luscious note card, <laughs> you know, the, the top priorities of work for the day prior to looking at, um, you know, email or text messages or any other input. And then I sort of view that as sort of like the defending champion on, okay, how's this day going to go? Well, this is the control that this is what needs to get beat. And so then when I look at my inbox, I'm sort of in a defensive posture as opposed to I'll do whatever is in there. I'll say, all right, are you more critical than this stuff that I've zeroed in on? And most mm -hmm. of the time it's not, but sometimes <laughs> it is. It's like, oh, hey, Pete, I need this thing or else you won't get paid. I was like, oh, um, okay, well, here, here you go. <laughs> Thanks. And then just sort of going after it. I, I like to do work in, you know, 60 to 90-ish minute bouts, if you will. So there's some time for resting. I think that's that's the scoop. I think I've learned that you know, we had a, a guest, Jenny Blake. She said it very nicely. She said, uh, you know, your body is your business. And that really resonates in terms of what I do to be energized pays rich dividends because that energy can be applied to really hard, tough, tricky, challenging, deep work activities that are, are highly valuable as opposed to the activities you're capable of accomplishing when you're, you're zonked <laughs> and, uh, and ready to be done working. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I love that. My favorite piece was the whole bit about sleep because I see my marriage in that as well. It just seems, and I did a little research on this, it does seem that, and even Ariana Huffington talks about this, that women can get by with less sleep. Like they genetically, they can survive better than we can with less sleep. But ironically, they actually need more sleep than we do. And I hmm. totally see this in my marriage. Like I cannot function unless I sleep. I'll kill people to get an extra hour of sleep. <laughs> I will kill people. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is we're both kind of a kind and, and not and nasty to each other, just about always, which is awesome. But like when I'm sleep deprived, like my face just has like a deadness about it. And my wife and her sweet compassion, she's like, I just, I don't know if I could do that to you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Pete, I want to transition now into uh, some of the rapid fire questions I like to ask. First off, I love to assign homework and I haven't been good about assigning homework to our audience recently. What's a homework assignment that people could do this week to act on some of the things they've learned so far in the episode? Oh, sure thing. Well, I would recommend that you sit down with a piece of paper and away from technology for a moment and then ask yourself some of those questions like, hey, what are the vital few things that will make a, a big impact? You know, you maybe if you have a few options, you put them through that kind of effectiveness ratio. Or you might ask uh, the one thing question uh, from my, I had a guest, Jay Papazan, who's awesome, uh, who said, hey, what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary? So having some of those, those reflection moments to dig into that, to, to surface the big priority and then schedule it would be huge. And, and I'd also say if we're kind of applying these same principles to podcast episodes, I put some of my most impactful ones in terms of listener favorite, high impact at the very beginning between episode zero and one labeled A, B, C, D, E, F. So if you want to do some superhuman learning in an efficient way, I'd recommend that you start with the, the very best. And so yeah, those are some homework bits. I love that. Love that. Speaking of homework, books. You and I both love books. I didn't make a habit of hanging out at the library as much as you did probably, but what are some of the books that have most, most impacted your life? I'm going to say... There's so many great ones and feel free to cut that out. I always do when I ask about books and people say, oh my gosh, there's so many great books. Yes, we know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me yours now. All right. So I'm going to go with, I think getting things done was huge from David Allen, just in terms of organization and not having everything just like taking over my brain, but having a trusted external system on which I'm putting the stuff so that that is well and handled. So that's huge. I think Influence, Science and Practice by Dr. Robert Cialdini, also so powerful in terms of how do you persuade and how are you being persuaded and how can you be more impactful. Elements of Style, uh, just about writing. I read yes. this book maybe once a year because it does the finest job I've seen. And I, I'd like to get more books like this, but I can't find any. It does the finest job I've seen of articulating what makes a sentence good and clear and what makes a sentence not so good and clear. Because often, if it's been too long since I've read that book, it's sort of like, I kind of know it when I read it, but I don't quite know why. But then when you, you go through it and, and it's like, all right, boom, omit needless words. Yeah. Or then okay. And then another law. And then another law. And you're like, oh, thank you. You know, my writing has been rejuvenated from this uh, annual reread uh, of this classic. So we'll, we'll leave it at three, unless uh, you're Jones for more. No, those are really, really good. Favorite products that help you perform at your absolute best. Oh, sure thing. Well, yeah, I'm holding one of them. We both had Chris Bailey on our shows. Yeah. And we had a lengthy talk about this pen. It is the Pilot Precise RT. And uh, I think it just writes like a dream. And I also like to write that on a, a Cambridge Limited business notebook. I think you can overdo it with the tools. It's not about the tools. But at the same time, if you have a little dose of delight when you use it, then you're more motivated to do so. I also love OmniFocus uh, in terms of talking about David Allen getting things done. If so fast, I hear an idea and instantly I could just sort of note that 
in the inbox like, oh, that sounds like a cool movie. I'll check it out. Boom. And it's not lost. And then later on, I will, will process it. And when I want to watch a movie, like weeks later, I can go over to the movie list. And so all these little tiny opportunities that would have disappeared had I not had a rapid capture tool, I now have uh, with that. So so I really dig that. As well as I think a sit-to-stand desk is really cool. There's a yeah. few great brands in terms of having that flexibility and ability to to stand up, sit down, or and even just adjust the height a little bit, you know, when, when you're in a different kind of a, a posture. Uh, so those are some of my faves. Love that. Tell me a little bit more about OmniFocus. I'm not familiar. Oh, sure thing. Well, so there's a lot of, uh, I think, productivity to-do list type applications. You got things, remember the milk. Do, do you use one? I use Asana, I use Evernote, but I'm not quite sure what one is because I, I still haven't figured out what OmniFocus, where to put OmniFocus in the right box. OmniFocus would be like Asana, except it's more for one person. So I think OmniFocus would call itself a task management application. Okay. So if a task comes up, I can sort of just add it to a running list in the inbox. But where it gets very powerful is that I can then sort of drag and drop or tuck those into specific projects and then place those as well as with tags and deadlines and I could sort of defer them or flag them. So it, you sort of have a, some nice flexibility with what you do here. And so I was just at the podcast movement conference and I've got so much, so many little tidbits. They start off as just like a, just a quick capture and you could chew on them. So for example, someone mentioned that a life insurance ad on an OJ Simpson podcast had tremendously high performance. Wow. And I just thought, that's very interesting. And then you could later on unpack that in terms of what is the significance of this? I guess if I'm going to pursue advertising, I should go with a super good fit. And if someone's listening about someone who allegedly killed somebody, then that might put you in a, a primed, privileged position to buy life insurance. Brilliant. And then what are some other instances of that in terms of, of podcast and advertiser fits that were excellent? And then where might I go? So anyway, I don't have time to think about all those things in the middle of the conversation, but I can just push a button, capture it, and then it, it's there for me to process it afterwards. Awesome. Love that. Really, really cool. I'm going to have to check out OmniFocus. Complete this sentence for me. Most people would be much better off if they just... I would say stopped breathed and thought through things as opposed to kind of retreating from boredom by firing up something digital and or entertaining. Really good. Really, really good. Pete, what's a question I should have asked you that I didn't? I think I often like to get some insight when it comes to asking about mistakes in terms of, you know, what's a common mistake people make? Sort of the, the stop doing part of, of the continuum. Mm -hmm. And there, I think the, the mistake could be for being awesome at your job. It's just sort of misunderstanding what do you mean by awesome. You could have one conception, your boss has a very different one. And until you sit down and, and have that sync up in terms of how do you define quality? What's really the priority? If I could nail three things this year, just extraordinarily well, what would your dream be for those three things? And so, so getting that alignment is so huge. And the common mistake is I had a guest, Mary Abajay, talked about managing up. And she mentioned that uh, the vast, vast majority of employees never have this conversation with their boss and it's to their detriment. Totally true. Totally True. All right, Mr. Pete Mokaitis, I know we are running up on time. I do want to give you an opportunity to let people know where they can reach out, where they can learn more about all the different stuff that you're doing. Listen to your podcast. Where should we send them? Oh, thank you. Well, I would say right there in your podcast playing app, you got it going right now. I'd recommend you search How to Be Awesome, and you'll see that lovely uh, yellow cover art with the, the girl looking upward. 
at the How to Be Awesome at Your Job podcast. And, and it would, yeah, start with some of the favorite episodes. At the very beginning, in between episode zero and one, I captured the, the fan favorites uh, labeled A, B, C, D, E, F. And they're cool. From a, a communication secrets from a FBI hostage negotiator to a rock star business school professor who's identified the, the key career derailers. Those are some uh, fun places to start. Love it. And I love that you make it really easy for people to get started. Another brilliant podcasting idea that I might just borrow from you. Pete, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Before I let you go, though, what's the one thing you hope people take away from this episode and remember for the rest of their lives? I hope that you take away from this episode that certain activities are massively more valuable than other activities. And thusly, it's very much worth your time to stop, think, ponder, identify those, and then doggedly pursue them uh, without getting distracted and doing what's sort of urgent and easy and fun, but rather uh, what's really high impact. So yeah, I hope you remember that. Brilliant. Pete Mikaitis, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit superhuman.blog. While you're at it, please take a moment to share this episode with a friend and leave us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next week.